Okay, last time what we were doing is we were talking about the functions of money. Uh, it starts off basically, why do people use money? Why use money? And what I said was because of the services that money provides. And then that got, to, got us down to this list of functions or services, uh, functions performed by money. You remember number one on the list is this money is the thing that people spend. Money is a medium of exchange. And we talked about the M1 money supply as that spendable kind of money in our economy. And almost all of that M1 money supply is currency, coins, and the paper currency, and checking deposit balances. And the other thing I mentioned, traveler's checks, is a small amount. And our total M1 money supply is in the neighborhood of $1.4 trillion. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. But anyway, medium of exchange, money is the thing that people spend. Money is generally acceptable in payment for goods and services. Number two, we talked about last time, money is a unit of account. If there were no money, then the value of everything would just be expressed in terms of other things. The value of your time, hey, how much is an hour worth of your labor? Or how much is an hour of your labor worth? Uh, two dozen eggs? Three pounds of hamburger, and just we would just value things in terms of other things, and that becomes extremely confusing. What we said about this is that there would be a vast amount of economic information that we would need to have in order to interact in our economy, that we, there would be high transactions costs. So uh, instead, we come along with the dollar, and we use the dollar for expressing these economic values, and so it's a common unit of measurement. Now, we face the same problem throughout uh, our lives. You know, if you go to the, um, the gas station to put gas in your car, we use a common unit of measurement there, the gallon. And so everybody goes, oh, those are gallons. There's so many gallons of milk, so many gallons of water, so many gallons of gas, and so forth. We've got a common unit of measurement of these fluids, and so we can keep track of what's going on easily without becoming confused. And if we get rid of such a thing as the gallon, then we start talking about these units, you know, like how many mouthfuls of water or how many handfuls of whatever, you know, like motor oil for your car and things. Life will become confusing. When we talk about the foot, how, you know, how tall are you? Feet or meters or whatever, how tall are you? We use um, the pounds or uh, kilos and so forth to measure weights. So we're always using these units of measurement to simplify life, and economic life is simplified by using the dollar. And it just so happens that we use the dollar for our medium of exchange, and we use the dollar for our unit of account, and that makes that simpler. And what we're doing is lowering transactions costs. Let me draw a graph before I go on to number three, which I'll do in a moment, but I want to draw a graph that sort of shows about these transactions costs and the role they play in the economy. We'll just take some typical representative good, good X. And so whatever you'd like that to be, it'd be fine, whether it is a hamburger or cars or houses or whatever. Just goods in general. And we'll measure that along the horizontal axis. And along the vertical axis, I'm going to put a dollar sign. Everybody studied this before. You've had another economics class. There's a supply curve and a demand curve. And every single time we do that, we find some equilibrium in the marketplace. We'll put Q and P, and that's the way the picture's drawn. Okay? And everybody's familiar with that. The only thing is, when you learn that in, in uh, what, principles of macroeconomics or principles of microeconomics, when you learn that, they made an assumption, and it's an assumption we don't make because this is money in banking. What they assumed when they drew that is, there's money in the economy. And for sure, we have money in our economy. But right now, we're going back and talking about the role played by money in the economy, and what if we didn't have money? What would this look like if we didn't have money? Well, 
Here's what we'd do is we'd say, you know, this supply curve, it represents production cost. And marketing costs and so forth. But this represents production costs. How much does it cost to produce a car? How much does it cost to produce a pound of chicken or a dozen eggs and so forth? Okay, whatever the good X is. To come back to here, what I told you last time is that without money in a barter economy, we have higher transactions costs. We have to find trading partners, people that want to do business with us. We have to satisfy that double coincidence of wants. And I use the example, if I wanted to trade economics for breakfast, I'm going to spend a substantial part of the day looking for people that would trade with me. And then there'll be lunch and then there'll be dinner. And then there's time that I need, you know, a car and I need shoes and I need all these things and I have to find trading partners and I'm using a substantial amount of my resources, my time and so forth, to find trading partners. That's a transaction cost. A cost of conducting a transaction. What I mentioned to you last time is this about the unit of account. That if we did not have money, if there's barter and everything is expressed in terms of everything else, then we would have an overwhelming amount of information to try and process. You remember we had that formula, the number of prices in the economy is the number of goods times the number of goods minus one over, what, two. And I used a very simple case, what, a thousand different goods, and what we had was approximately a half a million different prices, relative prices, goods traded for goods. And we'd try and juggle a half million prices. What if there are only, what if there are 1,000 goods and we have money? Each good's got a price. There's a thousand prices. So with money, we got a thousand prices. With barter and a thousand goods, we got a half a million prices. What if we have a situation where there are a million different goods in the economy? Wow, a million different goods, that'd be a million different prices in a money economy. But this would be approximately a million times a million, be slightly less, but a million times a million, that's a trillion divided by two, a half a trillion prices. Right? And so money s reduces the amount of information that we need to process. Money makes it easier for us to do business with other people because we know the value of what we're buying and selling. We're more likely to get a good deal. And you know what? If you went out there in the world and you were just going to trade with somebody and there's no unit of account, there's no common way of measuring, and you've just got to figure out, oh gosh, what, how many shoestrings is a dozen eggs worth? And you've got to do this all the time. You'd be, so people would be taking advantage of you constantly. And then after a while, what would we do? We'd just withdraw from the marketplace and say, you know what? I think I'm going to keep chickens. I think I'm going to raise my own chickens. I'll have my own eggs. And that way I don't have to worry about going out here and doing business with somebody and them taking advantage of me. So having all this information to deal with is a transaction cost. With barter and no medium of exchange, with barter and no unit of account, we have high transactions costs. So let me come back over here to my graph. This supply curve represents cost of production in our modern world. If we had those same costs of production, but then we had transactions costs in, ad in addition, then those transactions costs would be on top of production costs. Right now, if you buy something, if you buy a car, you're paying the cost of producing that car. But if in addition to the cost of producing, building the car, producing the car, if you also had transactions costs, those transaction costs would be an extra cost for you to deal with. And let's just put those on top of there. This vertical distance is transaction cost. And so we'd have a new supply curve. I'm going to put a B next to that. That would be the supply curve in a barter economy. And this would include production cost and transaction cost. And the supply curve, the first one, I'll put an M up here. This is a supply curve in a money economy. We've got the supply curve in a barter economy. Let's go back to our original P and Q where I said, well, here's equilibrium in the marketplace. This is really the quantity and the price in a money economy. And so if we go to a situation where we're looking at a barter economy, then what would happen is the price we pay would be higher for things and the quantity we have would be lower. 
Now, we pay a higher price for things, we consumers. The difference would just be the transactions costs. The seller wouldn't get that much. This would just be what buyers pay. Sellers would get less. We're paying so much because partly we pay to the sellers of the good, but partly we're using resources to find trading partners. We're using resources to manage all this, uh, this information that we have, this data. So anyway, we end up with consumers paying higher prices, having smaller quantities. Guess what? This uh, is a graph, but it just means poverty. It just means poor. When you don't have as much stuff, you just have a lower standard of living. And another way of saying this is, over time, these transactions costs come down, partly because we've introduced money into the economy. As the transactions costs come down, then we end up in this money economy situation with larger quantities and with a higher standard of living. And what we could say is this, without money, it would not be possible for us to have the high standard of living that we enjoy today. Okay? Without money, we'd all be living out here on the farm and basically raising our own chickens and raising our own cows and so forth and, and bartering with the neighbors, and we'd be conducting economic activity on a small scale. So anyway, this is the graph. There's only one thing wrong with the graph still, and it is I still left the dollar sign up here, even in a barter economy, and of course that's inconsistent, but I don't know what to put up there in a barter economy. So anyway, it's the idea of prices that I'm trying to represent here rather than a specific dollar price. So mm, I recognize that's there. Anyway, so this is the idea. This is a substantially lower standard of living. And here's another thing you can say. It's this. Nobody forces us to use money today. If you wanted, you could go out and you could talk to somebody and say, hey, I'll work for you for you know, two dozen eggs an hour and this sort of thing. We had the option of bartering even today. But guess what? That's an inferior possibility. People don't want to do that or they would be doing it. There's no law against it, but we don't anyway. And so that is something else that would tell us that's an inferior outcome. We don't want a barter. We want lower transactions cost. So anyway, let's go on now. And these are the two areas where money has lowered transaction costs in our society and allowed us to have a higher standard of living. The third function performed by money, money is a store of value. Money is an asset held to preserve purchasing power over time. A um, great example, because it involves almost everybody, is saving for retirement. You know, everybody wants to get old enough and retire and I guess revert back to the, the lifestyle of childhood where you just didn't have any responsibilities and just kind of take it easy. And the way that happens, of course, is in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, you put something aside and you save and then you retire. Yes, sir. Yeah. We're not making things here? Not, not anymore. Are, are you sure? Well, first of all, you know, and the question is basically how does, uh, you know, what about a service economy, an information economy? We're not doing as much of that physical manufacturing process as, uh, in terms of a percent of our economy as we used to or as other countries do now, is that getting in the way of our prosperity? I can tell you about the economics of it, and I will a little bit, but one thing you can do is kind of look around the world and see, well, where is there a more prosperous country than this one? And the answer is we don't find one. And if we don't find one, then gosh, I guess it didn't get in the way too much. Another thing is this, and just think about it in your own life, we only need a certain amount to eat. 
And once you've got that much to eat, do you need twice as much, three times as much, five times as much? And so is prosperity more? You can only drive so many cars. Once you get one car, do you need another one? Do you need a third, a fourth, a fifth, a tenth? You know, like if someday our economy is twice as prosperous as today, will that mean that every single person has two cars? Will it mean everybody is carrying two cell phones? Will it mean everybody's got two houses? Will you have a closet that's twice as big with twice as many clothes in it? And so I guess what I'm driving at here by asking these questions is to say that that's not really what we mean by prosperity. Our need for physical things is, at first, it's great. I mean, you know, you cannot live without some food. And at least in a cold climate, you've got to have a substantial amount of clothing, you've got to have some shelter. And so we've got to have these things. But once you get those things, then at that point, the good life, the quote good life, doesn't involve so much just tangible stuff you can touch. And now it's more a case of, I'd like to be amused. I'd like to be entertained. I'd like to be educated. I'd like somebody cutting my hair. You know, and so what happens is when societies become, you know, attain higher and higher standards of living, it's more of a service economy that people want. We have a choice. If you want, you can put your resources into just buying more clothes and saying, okay, I've got a closet that's, you know, I've got six feet of clothes here, you know, and now if my income triples, I'm going to have 18 feet of clothes in the closet. And I'm going to have three times as many shoes of my income triples. And I'm going to have three cars of my income triple. You've got that choice. But when you're given that choice, guess what? You don't choose that. So what we choose is things like, oh, gosh, I'm, I was in graduate school. I used to cut my own hair. That was a sad story. I'd hold like a mirror. Now, here's a mirror. I'm holding a mirror up. And I put that mirror down. I grab a hunk of hair, and I would cut it. And people would say, uh, Tom. Is there something the matter? It's like, are you dying or something? I notice there, you're losing hair back there. You know, it's just falling out in clumps. No, it's not falling out in clumps. I'm cutting my own hair. Why? Poor. So once I got a little bit of money, first job, you know, I start paying somebody to cut my hair. I always had my hair cut as a kid because my parents paid for it. Once I started paying, I'm just like, well, you know, that pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, so then I pay somebody to cut my hair. Go to a barber shop. Once I got more money, I stopped going to a barber shop because those guys cannot cut hair. Now, they can cut hair, but they cut everybody's hair the same. So anyway, the point is services. This is a service here, this service of education. I hate to be, you know, bragging. But this is a service. People don't have college in poor countries. You know, the kids get up and they go to work when as soon as you can get them to work and they just work throughout their life. After a while, yeah, you attain a certain standard of living, send the kids off to college. Then send the kids off to graduate school. That kind of stuff. Medical school. So I guess what I'm saying to you is this. It is true that our production of services as a percent of our economy is shrinking over time, but that's by choice. And what we do instead is, I mean, we've got a labor force of 160 million people, and if we wanted everybody to be working in a factory, all we have to do as consumers is just start buying stuff out of factories, you know, manufacture goods. And then there'll be more factories, and those factories will hire more workers, and the marketplace will accommodate that. We just don't want that. And so what we want is everybody, who wants to be without the Internet? You know, everybody wants this. It's a service, but it's information services. We want that. Used to be, what would happen is, you, and now a lot of people still do it, but you go to the movies, see a movie. What happens over time? Well, what happens over time is uh, you get Netflix, or maybe you watch movies on your computer. And so all of a sudden, if people are watching, a greater percent of our movies are being watched on Netflix or DVDs that you rent at Blockbuster or coming over the computer, then that means that they're building fewer theaters around the countryside. And so there's less construction activity. And that's a tangible good, but that doesn't mean we're poor. If you would rather watch a movie in your living room than go to a movie theater, you're better off, and we don't build as many theaters. And also there's lower construction costs. We've saved those resources. 
So anyway, I guess what I'm saying to you is we live in, there's a, per, a certain part of the economy that's dominated by the government where rules are uh, just like, here, we're going to do this, we're going to build a highway, we're going to build a hospital, we're going to do this or that, and that's the end of it, pay your taxes and we'll make that decision. But most of our economy is a market economy where freedom reigns and it's whatever we want. And so when we see our economy, you know, the percent of it devoted to manufacturing shrinking and the percent devoted to services going up, that's because that's what we want. And what we want, that's the stuff that is truly wealth. You know, it's like a higher standard of living is I'm getting more of what I want. And so a prosperous economy is one that basically raises the standard of living of the people who live there. And for us, a prosperous economy means having more services and fewer goods. I mean, that's kind of how that works out. There's an old debate about that, and the debate first came up where something real, something tangible, something meaningful, that's farm products. And this was what economists would talk about, you know, 75 years ago. And people would say, it's just not real anymore. You know, real is you raise your own food and you make your own clothes and this kind of stuff. And it's just not real to get that stuff out of a factory someplace. We ought to get rid of those big, you know, like slaughterhouses and all that stuff and raise your own cattle and sell them to the butcher in town and the butcher will slaughter those cows and you go right down there and get some food. That's real. And then they start saying it's kind of artificial to be, you know, like slaughterhouse in Chicago and they do all that stuff and then it's just shipped out to us in some refrigerated train car and this kind of thing. Well, so what I'm saying is there's always this question. We always have a transition. We always have changes in our economy. And that always raises the question of, hey, is what we're doing meaningful? Is, have we gotten away from the good old days and the good old ways and that sort of thing? And the answer is not really. So anyway, that's kind of a long answer to your question, but that's my answer. Let's come back to here. So money performs a function, by the way, not very well but money performs the function of a store of value. It is an asset, money is, and if you are saving for retirement or just saving up some, uh, some funds to buy a car, um, and saving is a key term here, but if you're saving, if you want, you can save money. You can use that as the asset that you hold on to. You can get some cash, you can get some money in your checking account, and just build that up. But that's not a very good way of saving. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is money earns little or no interest, right? That if you've got a dollar bill in your pocket and you put it in that pocket and keep it there, except for when you, you know, wash your clothes, then change to a different pair of, of pants. But if you put that money in your pocket and you just keep that there for a year after year after year and you get it out 20 years from now, it's still a dollar. So it didn't earn any interest. It didn't grow. Some checking accounts earn interest, but not very much. And so that's an inferior thing. Uh, what we have in more advanced societies, more advanced economies, I should say, is we have all these different options of places to hold our savings. We can put it into a savings account. You can put it into stocks and bonds. And there is really a wide range of investments. You can hold on to gold or silver and real estate and mutual funds and so forth. So anyway, money is not a very good store of value. It is in a less advanced economy, but ours is a pretty advanced economy, and so money is not a very good store of value. The other reason that money is not a very good store of value is inflation. Let me write this term down. Inflation just refers to increases in prices. And it's not a law or anything like that, but what economists do is they use the term, they say inflation is a tax on money balances. Here's what I mean by that. Suppose, and I'm going to use an example, but it's just an example to make it more obvious to you. Suppose that you go over to McDonald's or Burger King or someplace like that, and uh, you pull a dollar out of your pocket and say, hey, I want to buy a hamburger with that. And they say, okay, here's a hamburger. And the price of a hamburger, let's say, is a dollar. And so you hand the dollar over, they give you a hamburger, that's great. What if we have inflation? Prices start going up. 
What if we have, hypothetically, what if we have inflation where prices double? That, and I mean prices throughout society, shoes and everything else, but the price of hamburgers doubled. It was a dollar and now it went up to two dollars. So you go to McDonald's the next day and you pull that dollar out of your pocket and you slap it down on the counter and say, give me a hamburger. And then they hand you half a hamburger. And you say, hey, what's the story? And they say, well, a dollar, that's just for half a hamburger. And you say, yesterday I got a whole hamburger for a dollar. And they said, yeah, but we've raised prices. And with inflation, that's not the price of hamburgers going up. It's things throughout our society. But the point is that you've got the same dollar that you had the day before, the same amount of paper, but now the purchasing power of that paper has been cut in half by the inflation. And so it's as though inflation took away half of that dollar from you. The purchasing power of that dollar is being eroded. It's as though inflation is taxing away our money. So now let's go back to this idea of money as a store of value. Let's say you're saving for retirement. Let's say you got $100,000 in maybe your checking account or even cash or whatever. And you're saying, oh, I'm saving for retirement and prices go up. All of a sudden, you can't afford to retire because we've had inflation that's eaten away, eroded the purchasing power of that money. What can you do to avoid that? And the answer is you can hold on to other assets, other assets whose value keeps pace with, maybe even gets ahead of inflation. When we have a lot of inflation, gold tends to do very well. Real estate tends to do very well. And I'm not talking about the buildings, but the land itself tends to appreciate in value. And so during inflationary periods, something else is a much better asset to hold on to as a store of value rather than money. And so what I'm saying to you is this, is there's almost nothing that can take the place of money for medium exchange and unit of account, but money is not a very good store of value. And if people just stopped using money as a store of value, there would still be people using money for these other roles. A store of value, or money as a store of value, usually only occurs in less advanced economies where they just don't have the stocks and bonds and savings accounts and mutual funds and these other things. That's usually where it happens. And it especially does not happen. Money is especially not used in those, uh, as a store of value in those societies where they have a lot of inflation. Let me give you a little bit of a story about this. In the late 80s, 1988, 89, 90, along and there, they had the so-called Russian Revolution. Basically, and of course before that it had been the Soviet Union, basically what was happening was the Soviet, the Russian economy, was going through this very bad phase, kind of having a meltdown. They were having a political crisis, they were having an economic crisis. And so what happened is they ran into a situation where there was a lot of inflation. Okay, Prices were going up rapidly. Well, if you lived in Russia during this period, you could hold on to the currency they had there, the ruble, but that ruble, just like the example I used a moment ago, was being eroded by inflation. And the example I used a minute ago is you go into the store and one day the hamburger, or the restaurant, one day the dollar bill buys a hamburger, and the next day the dollar bill buys half a hamburger. They were going through that in Russia. And so then people said, I, I do not want to hold, at least for my store of value, I do not want to hold rubles. Those are being eroded rapidly. People would still use the ruble to buy things and to express values. But in terms of holding something for any period of time, that ruble was being eaten up rapidly by rising prices. So what did they do? Like I say, they continued using the ruble on the street. But then when it was time to store some wealth for a week, a month, a year, for retirement, they just said, no, I'm not going to hold on to rubles. As soon as I get a ruble, if it's not to spend it, as soon as I get it, I'm going to convert it into some other asset. And they didn't have mutual funds and stock markets and all these things. So what they converted into? Dollars. What they would say is, I want to trade my rubles for dollars. And there was a black market there where people were selling dollars out on the street. Oh, you want to trade some rubles? Okay, give me a million rubles and here's a hundred dollars or whatever. I don't know the exchange rate. But so people would do this. I remember seeing on television at the time, I don't know if it's CBS or which one of the news uh, uh, channels it was, but they went into a, an apartment of some fairly wealthy person in Russia, and you know, they're kind of looking around like this and how they're going to blur the face and so forth, and the person goes into their bedroom, opens a closet, down in the closet, and then pull out a shoebox, open the shoebox, 
$100 bills. Boy, I'd like to have a shoebox full of $100 bills. Anyway, but just hundreds and hundreds of $100 bills. Why that? And the answer is, well, if you had a billion rubles or whatever these numbers are, what would you do with it? Would you keep it in rubles and just let it be in, eroded on a daily basis? You can't put it in the stock market because they didn't have a stock market in Russia. You can't put it in, you can put it in a bank savings account, but then they would just pay you back in rubles and so it's being eroded by inflation. Where would you put that? Trade it for dollars. Now, the Soviet economy, and was at 89, I think they had, basically it went from Soviet Union to Russia. But anyway, and this was going on for several years, generally this, these inflation problems are the worst in countries that have a political problem. You know, you don't, if you don't have a political problem, you usually don't have the monetary policy that creates this inflation. But anyway, so this was going on for a multi-year period, for a decade or longer, but what was happening was people were just constantly going out and trading their rubles, their savings, for dollars. Estimates were made. This was all being done <coughs> secretly. There was nobody announcing, hey, today I traded a billion rubles for dollars. This was the kind of stuff you'd keep secret. And so, but estimates were made, and here's what the estimate was. On a daily basis, and I'm not saying a week or a month, on a daily basis, 100 million U.S. dollars would go into Russia. Huh, 100 million dollars a day. How much does that add up to? Well, in a week, that's 700 million dollars. Not quite, but the better part of a billion dollars a week. So how much would that be in a year? Well, 35 or 40 billion dollars a year. How long did this go on? Oh, a decade. Hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, currency, from the United States going into Russia. Russia's labor force, Soviet Union's labor force, was bigger than the United States. And the area that they had of land was huge. I think 8 million square miles where we had 3 million. So Russia had, the Russian people had an enormous need for savings. There weren't all these other financial institutions that we have, so they're just accumulating dollars. And so vast numbers of our amounts of our currency worked its way into Russia. Yes, sir? Who were they trading the rubles to? Who were they trading the rubles to? Well, basically there are currency markets, right? I mean, like uh, banks, we don't come into contact with this on a daily basis, but banks are just trading, and, and there are other currency traders just trading one kind of currency for another kind of currency. And so what would happen is somebody would go out and get a bunch of dollars and then trade it for rubles and then take it and sell it on the world market for rubles, sell those for whatever they can get. Maybe more dollars. Now, how about us? What's the situation we're in? Here's what we're in. We're going, oh, we're giving up paper. I mean, isn't that it? We're giving up paper in exchange for, if we want, rubles. And then we can take the rubles, we Americans and so forth, and go over and buy oil or timber or gold or diamonds or whatever it is they have for sale. They didn't have many consumer goods we wanted to buy but they had a lot of raw materials. And so basically, we were handing over paper, and you know, we could make that paper 10 times as valuable just by adding another zero. Here's a $1 bill, put a zero after it, same amount of paper, same amount of ink, and we can get 10 times as much stuff out of Russia in terms of timber and oil and natural gas and things like this. And so we were giving up something that's very low cost to produce it and getting something back valuable. Why are they willing to make that trade? And the answer is, they didn't have a good place to save their assets, their wealth, their savings. They didn't have a good place to do that, so they just took our paper. Now, this went on for years and years, and I don't mean to say 100 years, but it went on for years. Almost at any point in time, there are some country or countries experiencing some kind of an economic crisis of this nature, and in those countries, they are going, wow, I'd like to hold something else, something that's not being eaten up by inflation. And the dollar is something that's very commonly held, but over time, it used to be, of course, that in Europe you would have the German mark and the Swiss franc and the French franc and, and so forth. Each country had its own currency, and now they're working with the euro, and so the euro, which has become the common currency throughout Western Europe, the euro has become something that in other countries they like to hold on to also, to basically beat inflation to deal with this problem. 
But this has gone on. I told you I'd come back to this, so this is a good time to do it. These numbers are approximately, I told you, the M1 money supply. It's about, and these are ballpark numbers, $700 billion worth of currency and $700 billion in checking deposits. Okay, that's the official U.S. money supply, but I just told you a little story here, and what you should know is that maybe on the order of, I don't know, 400, 450, and I'm going to put a question mark, billion dollars of this currency is outside the U.S. That is to say, yeah, we've got 700 billion, more or less, 700 billion dollars worth of currency in circulation, but most of it not in circulation within our borders. Somebody overseas is holding on to it. Why? Because they got an economic crisis overseas, and the way they deal with that's hold on to dollars for their savings as opposed to hold on to their own currency. If you look at these tables that show, and you can find this online at the Federal Reserve's website, if you look at the tables that show how much currency outstanding there is or currency in circulation, far and away, the biggest chunk of that $700 billion is $100 bills. Now, I have owned $100 bills, and I'm sure many of you have, but I'm just saying that most of the money I own is not $100 bills. But most of, most of the currency, I don't know, I should say, but most of the currency in circulation of U.S. dollars, $100 bills. Why? Because when you're saving this stuff, you want to put $100 bills in the shoebox, not once. This takes 100 times as many shoebox if you use once. And so money as a store of value, or our currency as a store of value, is being held overseas by a lot of people in large denomination notes. There's never been an official announcement about it, but... Our biggest note, our biggest uh, denomination of currency is a $100 bill. When the euro came out, they said, hey, let's put out a 500 euro note. And the 500 euro note, nobody, I shouldn't say nobody because it's not an absolute, but almost nobody is walking around pulling out a 500 euro note saying, give me a haircut. Here is the equivalent of $800. Give me a haircut. The 500 euro note is most valuable to people that are holding their savings in shoeboxes. And so I guess what I'm telling you is that I believe the European Monetary uh, uh, Bank, or the Euro uh, European Central Bank, is putting out these 500 euro notes because they're trying to compete with us in this world market out there of people trying to hold their savings, their store of value, in the form of some foreign currency. Yes, sir? And that's illegal to be doing that? You say is it illegal? Well, I'll tell you what is legal for us is if you move, I think the number is $10,000 of currency over the border, you're supposed to declare that. You know, where they come on an airplane, you're going overseas, and they give you this thing and fill this out for customs and all that stuff. You're supposed to start telling them you're carrying a lot of currency. And so if you don't tell it, you've broken the law. And um, in some countries, this is illegal. Several years ago, there was a story of um, some bank, I think it was in Boston, and it had some customer overseas, or customers. We don't, I don't really know the details because I just read about it in the Wall Street Journal. But anyway, so this customer overseas, and possibly somebody living in Russia, but anyway, uh, they wanted U.S. currency. And so what was happening was uh, this bank had a, some official, I think a vice president, uh, that was loading currency up in suitcases and going down and getting on an airplane and flying overseas and delivering this currency and coming home and getting some more and then flying overseas and delivering. But this is before they had all the security, you know, after the 9-11 attacks and so forth. But back in those days, you just unless there's some reason, they would not go through your suitcase. And so this guy is carrying money. And I think took over a billion dollars overseas. I could be wrong about this, but it was vast amounts. And then they got caught, the bank did, doing that, and then there was a substantial fine. And, uh, you know, and don't do that again. But anyway, so there are laws that govern this. In some countries, maybe those laws aren't so severe. Uh, I think right now in Zimbabwe, which is in, uh, in Africa, I think they have a severe situation right now with inflation. I've seen pictures of this. 
uh, of the hundred trillion dollar <laughs> hundred mm, that would be a hundred thousand uh, million billion uh, trillion the hundred trillion dollar note the Zimbabwe dollar anyway and people like I've had friends overseas and they send this to me saying I'm a trillionaire you know this sort of thing um, yeah anyway so when you've got inflation, when prices are rising like that, then what happens is people just start fleeing that currency. It may still be the case, though. You walk out on the street and say, hey, I want to buy a loaf of bread. Pay with whatever the currency is that trades on the street. But as soon as you get a bunch of that currency, then hurry, quickly, convert it into something else that isn't being eaten up by inflation. They would have to have like even bigger notes just to get the zeros on there. Boy, they put the zeros on there, too. You know, um, I think the story, I'm not sure, but I think the story was uh, Germany following World War I, between World War I and World War II. I think what happened was their printing presses could not keep up. They had, uh, they were printing more currency. And let's say here's a thousand. They were printing more currency. And uh, so then their printing presses just couldn't print it fast enough. So then they just would come back in and put another zero on. You know, and like, oh, we got room for another one. Anyway, a lot of interesting stories about this stuff. Anyway, to kind of come back, why do people use money? Money performs various functions. And these two functions, medium of exchange, unit of account, it performs very well. And this third one, store of value, not so well. At least our own money doesn't uh, perform that uh, very good um, uh, function as a store of value. In some countries, if they do not have um, uh, savings accounts and stock markets and things like that, then maybe they do hold money as their store of value. But it's just not a very good store of value. Let's talk about evolution of the payment system. This course is money and banking, and this is uh, the only unit where we just focus on money. And it kind of goes slowly, but it's good to know about money because it fits in, or it figures into so much of our later discussion. We already talked about barter, and so I'm not going to continue with that. Barter is just exchanging one good for another good, or good for services and so forth. Uh, I didn't use the term, but our second stage in this evolution of money is commodity money. And what I mentioned to you is in Sumer, for example, they use barley, uh, wool, and silver. And so commodity money. Now, what we mean by commodity money is this. We're using something for money, but it can also be used as just a commodity. People have a commodity use for barley and wool and silver. And so if you came up and said, hey, I want to trade for you, I'll give you some wool, and they say, no, you can always make clothes out of it. Not you but, or I, but somebody can. And so anyway, money was a commodity. Okay, we were just using commodities to begin with, and now what's happened with commodity money is we've just focused on a few specific commodities, not just everything. Okay? It's like, oh, these three things work better than other things. These are the things I'm going to start buying goods and services with. And by the way, I will also accept barley, wool, and silver from other people if they want to buy something I have. And so society starts focusing on a, just a few commodities. Different commodities, different places. I mentioned, again, uh, I mentioned about uh, in Virginia, 300 years ago, they used tobacco leaves. So a different commodity in a different place. Uh, in the um, Mediterranean Sea, there were little copper ingots. They'd have a little bag, and it was sewn shut, so you knew that the contents hadn't been uh, uh, changed. But anyway, but a little leather bag, and it would be full of copper. And then this copper bag of a certain weight and a certain size, that was used as money. And copper had value as a commodity. It could be used to make metal objects with, but also it could be used as a money. Okay. Uh, the next step, coinage. Now we're still talking about commodities, but now the commodity is put into a certain form. And what's the form? It's a little disk, right? And the first coins that we would say are coins of any substantial value, 
and there's always a transition phase, so I don't want to let on like this was all on one day. But around 640 BC in Lydia, which is western Turkey, bordering on the Mediterranean Sea, those are the first coins that we would say qualify as modern coinage. Like I say, there was a transition period and people tried other things. Oh, by the way, I, I mentioned it before, but Sumer, this is around 2500 BC. And so, gosh, we're talking of 18, 1900 years later, and somebody said, hey, let's put that commodity in a certain form. Okay, what was the commodity? What are the coins made of? Something called electrum. And electrum was a combination of gold and silver. And this was an alluvial gold, silver. Uh, and by alluvial, I mean it was found in uh, riverbeds. Turkey has some mountains which are volcanic in nature. And so what happened is all this heat activity below the surface of the earth and there was gold and silver, you know, down there buried uh, uh, away from where we could see it, but it got warmed up and the volcano, and when it warms up, it's just tiny little specks in many cases under the Earth's surface, but when it warms up, it kind of runs together and makes little chunks, and then there's a volcanic eruption, and we're talking a long time ago, millions and millions of years, and the volcanic eruption throws this stuff out, and so now you've got gold and silver up in, in the high mountains, and then there's snowfall, and then there's the melt, and then the water runs down, and over the, not just centuries, but over the thousands and tens of thousands of years, some of this gold and silver got melted down in, in the riverbeds and so forth, running toward the Mediterranean Sea. And so people in Lydia, western Turkey, picked this stuff up, and a merchant said, hey, this is a neat idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to standardize this. I'm going to get a little bit of this metal and I'll make a bunch of these little discs of a certain standardized size and I'll put my stamp on it and then that will be something people will recognize and people started using that to trade. And it wasn't very long after that, but I mean it wasn't very long in terms of, look, we're talking 18, 1900 years, but maybe 25 years, something like that, the people in Lydia and Turkey and so forth they're doing business with other people in that neighborhood of the eastern Mediterranean, Greece. And so the people in Greece, they see this and they say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's make our own coins. And so the idea of coinage spread from western Turkey into Greece. They didn't have like, you know, a dotted line and, and guard posts and things like that saying here's the border. Just people doing business with each other and a bunch of islands and things like that. And so the people in Greece started making their own coins. And so along things go for about 300 years. And then about 300 years later, around 330, and I'm going to put a plus or minus, BC, there was this guy in Greece who had grown up and seen coins and so forth all of his life. But the only thing is, was that guy in Greece just, uh, he had these aspirations of having an empire. And his name was Alexander the Great. Alex the Great. The was his middle name. That's what they call him. Sometimes they just call him the, in fact. Anyway, so Alexander the Great is out there with it. No, that is not true. He was out there and he conquered this empire and uh, various times. I mean, the empire went to like the, uh, the western part of India all the way over to, gosh, the western part of Europe and then down into the Middle East. He had this vast empire, and he wasn't always everywhere. He had generals that would basically run different parts of the empire. But what happened was Alexander the Great conquered a city with vast amounts, mainly of silver, and I mean tons and tons and tons of silver. And so then what he says is, hey, let's make some coins. And he didn't invent the idea of coinage. He had always seen it, I mean, like for 300 years in Greece where he grew up, they had coins, but now all of a sudden he goes, hey, I got all this silver, let's make some coins and put my picture on it. 
And so he's got this vast empire, I think three, four million square miles, if you put it all together. And so over his empire, these coins with Alexander the Great's image on it started circulating as money. And so the idea started small, but Alexander the Great is the one who spread the idea of coinage throughout a large part of the world, and there's never been a time since then when there wasn't coinage. Paper money. And that is the first thing we're going to talk about next time. Paper money. Where did it develop? China. Ah, that was just the teaser to get you back next time. So long. Teaser. By the way, what happens next time? Quiz. Quiz. Bye.